And good afternoon. It is Thursday, the 28th of January, and this is episode 37 already of Thursdays with Charlie. Welcome back and glad to have you with us today. Well, we're still continuing the reservation system for our masses. We got word from the diocese this week that they were easing up on some of the regulations, but when I read through the easing up on the regulations, it really isn't anything that affects us for the good. Uh, they're going to say that instead of having a individual phone number for every person, I can have an, a phone number for every family group. That doesn't really change every anything for us. We still have to wear masks. We still have to take temperatures. We still have to limit our attendance to only 25% of the occupancy. Uh, and we still need to keep uh, these records for contact tracing. So it doesn't really, even though they said they're new res regulations, it doesn't really change anything for us. They also did say that we cannot serve food, which we knew about already, and we cannot set up a meeting in any way where people would be facing each other. So everything would have to be set up almost like a classroom setting with a speaker facing out, but no groups around a table or sitting in a circle or anything like that. So hopefully that will come sooner rather than later. But that's where we are right now. The reservation system still continues. We're limited to 100 persons per mass. The 4 p.m. on Saturday fills up. So we're pretty close to capacity on that. But the other masses, the 6 p.m. on Saturday, the 8 a.m., 10 a.m., and noon on Sunday, we always have some room. So should you forget to make the phone call on Thursday or Friday to make a reservation, please feel free to come to the 6 on Saturday, the 8, the 10, or the 12 on Sunday. And chances are really good we can accommodate you, and we look forward to uh, having you uh, with us for those Masses. We're still waiting on word from the diocese as to when the bishop will be able to come down for our dedication. We're looking forward to getting that word probably before this weekend. And if we have it on Sunday of the weekend, we'll give it to you gladly. Uh, we're asking for the bishop, um, Most Reverend George Leo Thomas. We're asking for our vicar general, Monsignor Gregory Gordon, who has a great interest in Father Garces. And we're asking for Father uh, John McShane, our founder priest uh, who has a very great interest and has written some things about Father Garces. So we're going to hope for the all three uh, to come and we'll know the details and as soon as we know the details we'll pass the, the details on for you. We do have Father Michael Moore coming for our parish mission, and that I'm very grateful. I got that approved to the diocese, so we're okay. We will have to take reservations for it, and we will have to take your uh, names and phone numbers, and we will have to take your temperature at the door, and you will have to wear a mask, and we are limited to only 100 people. But he'll be here for the parish mission from the 22nd through the 25th of uh, February. Uh, Lent begins on the 17th of February with Ash Wednesday, and the 20s, uh, Father Michael will preach all the Masses uh, on the 20th and the 21st on the weekend, and then he'll do the mission Monday through Thursday, the 22nd through the 25th. As soon as we get the forms made out for the reservation system for that, we will be glad to start taking them, as we know a lot of people are very interested in Father Michael coming, and we're looking forward very much to having him here with us for the parish mission. I think this is his 13th or 14th year doing it for us, so we're very glad that we've had that relationship and we continue to have it with Father Michael Moore. Now, I was lucky. I've been trying to do a lot of research on Father Garces, Father Francisco Garces, and I've been concentrating on his diary from 1775 through 1776, which included his visit to what is now our little place here in Laughlin, Nevada. But it occurred to me that he was in the New World, he was in the Tucson area from 1768 already. 
And so I began to research a little bit, and I found that he kept some sort of a diary throughout much of his life. And so this past week or two, I've been able to have access to some of those writings. And in doing that, I found writings by some of the Franciscan priests, the fathers, who lived with him uh, in Tucson. He was assigned in 1768 to San Xavier del Bach uh, in Tucson, what is now Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and we, I got to visit there a year ago. And so I have a connection with the place, but I'm now finding some of these writings. And so one of the ones I found, Father Garces went off uh, to visit with uh, an Indian tribe just north of where the mission was. And he was gone for several days. And when he got back, one of the other Franciscan friars who was living with him uh, at San Xavier del Bach in Tucson uh, had this to write about Father Garces' return. He arrived back sound, fat, merry, and well content. I think that's a cool description of him. I've never seen a description of his size before, and perhaps it was just hyperbole on the part of the other father describing it, but sound, fat, merry, and well content. He came in from this mission trip uh, to the other Indian tribes. He also mentioned that Father Garces was, quote, dressed in the very same clothes that he took from his mission, missing not one thread except for his cord, and that not because it was taken from him by the Indians, but because one night when he was alone, he tied his horse up with it, and the horse jerked and broke the cord into three pieces. That's how he lost uh, his Franciscan cord. I thought I would bring in an example. Uh, the Franciscans, like many religious orders, wear a cord in place of a belt. Uh, they wear it to hold their habit in, uh, to keep their, their pants up under the habit, perhaps, as well. And the cord has traditionally been uh, a rope tied with three knots, uh, signifying the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And in fact, the knot that developed for uh, this is called the Franciscan knot. Now, when I was researching Father Garces over the past couple of years, I said, gee, I want to someday have a complete habit as he would have looked back in the 1700s when he was in our area preaching to the Indians and for the Spanish settlers as well. And so I went out to buy one and they said, well, the Franciscans would sell me one of their cords, but it was like $29 for a cord. And I said, well, that's a little bit expensive for just a cord. And I went to a rope store, a hardware store, and I bought a rope. And I bought the rope for about $2. Uh, and then I went on YouTube and I learned how to tie the Franciscan knot. And so these knots that are on here, the Franciscan knot is kind of like a, a slip knot with a little bit of extra twirling. And there are three times it is wound around and then pulled tight. The knot itself signifies the three vows of the poverty, chastity, and obedience, and there are three of them, one for each of the vows. And so I managed to tie this myself, and so for $2 I got what would have cost $29 and something had I purchased it. But it was kind of an interesting process, and it reminded me that, you know, Mia might want to look up the Franciscan knot on YouTube and just see how easy it is to tie, and it makes a very nice little connection with our past. So the Franciscan knot on this uh, cord, the cord is actually called a cincture, uh, and this will be a uh, part of our Father Garces uh, display that we're building towards. I'll tell you more about the display in the coming weeks, but that's the cord for it. In researching some of the writings about Father Garces, uh, Father Salazar was one who wrote about him. Father Font wrote about him. There were several others that wrote a, about him uh, in their diaries and their records. Uh, and one night, 
this is probably around 1770, uh, they were looking at the diary that Father Garces had kept and trying, Father Garces was with them, and were trying to make sure that it was all correct and all complete so that they could have a, a permanent archive of his missionary journeys as well as the journeys of the other Franciscan friars there. And this was one of the comments that one of the Franciscan priests at San Xavier del Bac made about the notes that Father Garces had put in to his diary. Only with no form and in such miserable handwriting that the father himself could hardly read it. So I kind of feel close to Father Garces. My handwriting is pretty miserable as it is, and I now know that I share that with Father Garces. In going through some of his earlier diary entries, though, I did find two entries that really intrigued me. In 1768, shortly after he had arrived in the Tucson area and had met with some of the tribes in the area, Father Garces wrote in his diary, and this is a quote, I like the Indians very much. It was kind of beautiful to see that from the heart of his missionary spirit. Now, I like the Indians very much. And then reading further on, probably early in the 1770s, uh, Father Garces wrote this, Patience is essential and not being afraid, for without patience and, and resolve, little will result. I think that recognition that patience is essential Patience is needed not only in his missionary work and dealing with the Indians, dealing with foreign languages, dealing with being out of his Spanish culture, but I think it's necessary in our lives too, that idea that we can be patient, patient with ourselves and patient with God. God is going to achieve his purposes, but it may not be in our time frame. It may be more in God's time frame. So perhaps that lesson from Father Garces, patience is essential, not being afraid, for without patience, little will res uh, patience and resolve, little will result. Today's feast, uh, the 28th of January, is the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, one of the greatest scholars the Catholic Church has ever produced. His feast day used to be on March the 7th. And that was the day of my baptism. So I was baptized on the feast of St. Thomas Aquinas, March the 7th. But then in the 1960s, the church moved his feast day from March 7th back to January 28th so that it would be out of Lent and would never be superseded by one of the celebrations of Lent. I enjoy reading about St. Thomas Aquinas while he's regarded as one of the most brilliant minds that the church ever produced. When he was in school, he was actually considered to be uh, quite slow. And his nickname in school, in our equivalent of what would be like high school or university, was he was nicknamed the Dumb Ox. And the poor guy had a bear with that. But one of his teachers, who himself became a saint, Albertus Magnus, was one of the teachers of Thomas Aquinas. And he heard that nickname used for Thomas, the dumb ox. And Albertus Magnus' comment was, he may be a dumb ox, but his bellow will be heard around the world. He recognized Thomas Aquinas' greatness uh, even at, at a young age. Thomas Aquinas, as he grew older, he was a member of the Dominican religious order, uh, and he developed kind of a weight problem. Uh, Father, uh, they describe it that he was actually quite heavy, and most of his work was not physical work, it was scholarly work. But one of the stories that I, I learned about him is that as he grew older uh, and he would come to the dining room, he had trouble getting to the dining room table uh, because his stomach would be so large. And so they did a special cutout of the table so that he could actually sit with the other brothers for his meals. I think that's kind of a, an interesting story about a great saint, 
uh, who was dealing with some physical attributes. Thomas Aquinas is known primarily by us for writing the Summa Theologica, a great collection of Catholic theology. He was born in 1226, so he's a contemporary of St. Francis of Assisi, uh, and he took 1,200 years of theology, of the Church's teachings, of the Church's beliefs, the Church's morals, and he was able to put them into this compendium, the Summa Theologica. He developed a system of thinking which has come down to our own day and is known as scholasticism or the scholastic method. Very reasonable, very logical, very scholarly. He was also a great writer of hymns. Uh, some of our most famous hymns in Latin and, and now in English come to us from St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, one of the most famous is Panis Angelicus, the bread of angels. If you ever have a chance to hear some of the great uh, singers of our time doing that, uh, Andrea Bocelli did a beautiful version of that. He's famous for the Pange Lingua, uh, and part of the Pange Lingua is one of our benediction hymns, the Tantum Ergo. Pange Lingua in Latin means uh, sing my tongue. And the song is sing my tongue, the Savior's glory. The Tantum Ergo was the last two verses of the Pange Linga. So great a sacrament. We sing that at benediction. He's also famous for writing the uh, Adoro Te Devote, which in English we sing as Humbly We Adore Thee. That's a beautiful communion hymn. Most of Thomas Aquinas' hymns that he wrote, the words to, were all connected with the Holy Eucharist. He had a great devotion uh, to the, the Mass and to the Holy Eucharist, to the importance of receiving communion, to the importance of being with Christ uh, in the Eucharist. He's also very famous in this, for his scholastic method. He devised what are called the five proofs for the existence of God. Now we have to understand proof is, is not exactly the way we would understand proof. It doesn't prove absolutely, but it proves logically. It is more logical to think that there is a God than, than it is logical to think that there is is not a god and so i thought i'd go over i used to teach these to my sophomores uh when i taught high school and i thought i resurrected some notes and i thought we should just go over the five proofs they're fun to think about uh and they're they're kind of compelling uh, the first proof that thomas aquinas puts forward for the existence of god is the proof from motion that motion has to have a beginning things don't move unless somebody moves them. That's why they go. And he says, you can go back and say, well, that object moved that, or that person moved that. He said, at some point, you have to go back to a first mover or a prime mover. Some people say that physics actually supports this uh, right now by saying that if we have an expanding universe, it has to have started at some point expanding. And whatever caused that start would be the prime mover of Thomas Aquinas and would be uh, one of the proofs. It's reasonable to think that there is a God. <clears throat> Second proof is very similar to that. Uh, as we spoke in the first proof, there's a first mover. St. Thomas Aquinas says for anything in the world, there has to be a cause cause and effect go hand in hand, but it's illogical to go back and say there's a, an, well, that caused that, well, that caused that. Ultimately, we have to get, according to Thomas Aquinas, to the first thing that caused something else to happen. And he says, whatever that is, that's God. Notice these proofs are not telling us an awful lot about God. They're just saying that it's very reasonable to believe, to think, that there is a God. In fact, it's more reasonable to think that there is one than it would be reasonable or unreasonable, actually, to think that there isn't. The third proof is the proof from contingency uh, versus necessity. And Thomas Aquinas posits that if everything is contingent, then it could all go out of being. 
if you have contingent things, things that depend on other things, there has to be logically something that's necessary. And the necessary is the beginning of things that are contingent. And so we can argue that, obviously, we know a lot of contingent things in life, but the one necessary thing for life to exist would be God. And so it's reasonable to assume that there is a God. The one I like best is his fourth proof for the existence of God, and that's from perfection. He said, if we can make comparisons, if we can say that something is good, well, then we can also say that something is better. And if we can say that something is better, it's logical to assume that there's something that's best. Otherwise, what are we making the comparison on the basis of? And so the argument from the idea of perfection, that if something is good, there's something better, and logically, there's something best. If there's something strong, there can be something stronger, but it's logical to assume that there should be something that's the strongest. If there's something beautiful, there can be something more beautiful, and it's logical to assume there should be something that's the most beautiful. That's the proof of uh, Thomas Aquinas that I, I like the best. I kind of like the idea that if we're making comparisons, we get to a point where there has to be that perfection in comparison. The fifth proof that Thomas Aquinas has is what's called the anthropic principle, that our universe is designed in such a way that it makes our life possible. And if there's such a benevolent design in the universe, we have air, we have beauty, uh, we have uh, food, we have all these relations with one another. If there's something so beautiful by design, there must be a designer. And God is that designer. And I, I think that that's a beautiful proof. I wish we know the world works in our favor. We know we have good relationships with people. We know we have things like love and free will that are so important to us. We know we can breathe the air that's around us. That was put there by design. And if there's design, then Thomas Aquinas says, it's logical there should be a designer. One other thing that Thomas Aquinas wrote that I really have always liked is he had a definition for evil that I think is very, very powerful. Thomas Aquinas said, evil is the absence of good where there should be good. He defines evil as something very, very negative. It's not that it's something, it's an absence of something. And it's sad because it's an absence of good where there should be good. I like that definition very much for evil. Well, after that romp through scholastic, scholastic philosophy, it's time for Pascal to join us. <clears throat> and today he brings us what I think would be our first of many quotes that we're going to remember from Father Garces. Patience is essential. In Latin, patientia necessaria est. Patience is essential. We have to be patient with ourselves. We have to be patient with God. After all, it is still God's world. God bless you, and thanks for joining us.